Welcome into Detroit's only nightly political talk show as we keep you up to speed with the election approaching quickly. I'm Rupraj. 39 days, that's it. And if you're voting early or absentee, even less time than that for the candidates to make a final push for your vote. More on that in just a second. But right now, here's what else we're working on tonight. Vice President Harris sitting down for her first solo interview with a journalist last night. The economy was a huge topic. What she said about union leadership throwing support her way. Coming up, and speaking of the vice president, a new poll from the Associated Press shows how many Americans think her gender will actually stand in the way and hurt her chances at winning the White House. We're breaking down those numbers and getting reaction tonight from two high-profile women. But now, to a voting, back to voting for a second, though, because today's a big day in our state. It is the day clerks start sending absentee ballots to voters for the November election. It's also the day those secure drop boxes must be available 24 hours a day for you to return those ballots. Now, here's a 411 on early in-person voting, which is different, by the way, than absentee voting. Communities must start providing early in-person voting starting on October 26th, but... They can start offering it as early as October 7th. The early voting period ends November 3rd, the Sunday before the big vote. Security, obviously, a huge concern. It's top of mind as we approach this election. And so the Pistons Performance Center is one spot where ballots will be counted in the city of Detroit. So not a bad place to talk about the game plan for Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. She spoke about what her office is doing now to keep election officials safe. We are making an additional $5 million in grant funding available to local jurisdictions today to implement any election security measures that they still need for the 2024 election cycle. These grants can be used to boost physical security and resiliency against cybersecurity threats, as well as purchase additional voting equipment. I hope all clerks take advantage of these funds and use them for any remaining security needs. Now, here's the issue. If you want to vote absentee but haven't signed up yet, we have you covered. All you have to do is go to fox2detroit.com and find the story about it starting today, and there you'll see a link on how you can get it done. Vice President Harris sitting down for her first one-on-one -on -one interview with a journalist. You know, she was in town last week for that event with Oprah Winfrey, and then before that, you may say, well, she did an interview, but that was with her running mate, Governor Tim Walz. They did that sit-down with CNN late last month. Now, last night's interview was with MSNBC's Stephanie Rule. They talked mostly about money, the economy. Harris was asked about the Teamsters declining to endorse either candidate this year. Here's what she had to say. Part of the challenge, and I don't disagree that it's a challenge, got to earn the vote of everybody, is reminding people of fact, um, regardless of what somebody says in a, in a small rally somewhere. And I think that's really important. And that's part of what I'm doing in this campaign is to remind people, uh, just like here in Pittsburgh, of the reality of who has stood with union labor, who stands for American manufacturing, who stands for American jobs. Now, Harris is scheduled to visit the border tomorrow. As you know, the Trump campaign has hit her hard about that issue, so she's leaning into it rather than running from it. Harris pledged if she wins the election, she'll make sure that bipartisan border bill that was killed in the Senate back in February passes Congress and is signed into law. In the meantime, former President Donald Trump bringing up Harris's planned visit to the border while speaking to the press at Trump Tower today. He had this to say about her upcoming trip. Why would she go to the border now, playing right into the hand of her opponent? I mean, you take a look at this, why would you do that? There can be no justification for what she's done. There's no... Nobody saying, oh, gee, she's done a fabulous job. She's done the worst job probably in the history of any border, not just our border. So what's Trump's solution? He says he plans to kick hundreds of thousands of these migrants out of the country, out of the U.S., who've entered the U.S. under two Biden administration programs. Those programs allow people to come into the country under humanitarian parole for two years. The Biden administration says those programs reduce chaos at the border and allow more migrants coming in to be vetted. Well, we don't need to tell you how big of a battleground state, of course, our great state of Michigan is. And before the week is over, we'll have two more candidates campaigning in our state. Former President Trump will return to Michigan for two campaign events on Friday. The first stop will be in Walker on the western side of the state. He'll be speaking at a manufacturing facility there. And then at 6, he'll host a town hall meeting right here closer to home at Macomb Community College in Warren. On the other side of the ticket, Minnesota governor and Democratic vice presidential candidate Tim Walz will be in Michigan on Saturday for 
the Wolverines football game versus Minnesota. Of course, he'll watch the game at the Big House, but he'll also talk with students at some point as well. By the way, in case you were curious, kickoff for the game between the Wolverines and Golden Gophers is noon Saturday here on Fox 2. Take the politics out of it. Sorry, Mr. Wallace, no one's going to be rooting for your team at the Big House. It'll all be maize and blue, won't it? Well, former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani can no longer call himself a lawyer in Washington, D.C. You see, he was disbarred by an appeals court today, just months after losing his license in New York for pursuing false claims that Donald Trump won the 2020 election. Now, in its ruling, the D.C. court cited rules of reciproc reciprocity between the two jurisdictions and also said that Giuliani did not respond to an order to explain why he shouldn't be disbarred in Washington. Today's move is the latest in the fallout for Giuliani, who was one of Trump's most vocal supporters in 2020. Prosecutors in Georgia and Arizona have brought charges against him in connection to election subversion schemes. And last year, a jury awarded 148 million bucks in damages to two former Georgia election workers who sued him for defamation. Well, it's a political witch hunt, and I'm not stepping down. That's the message from New York City Mayor Eric Adams tonight after he was indicted on federal charges that he allegedly took bribes and illegal campaign contributions from foreign sources. Today's indictment comes after a year-long investigation, but the allegations stretch back a decade to when he was the Brooklyn Borough President. Among other things, prosecutors say Adams received more than $100,000 in free and discounted flight upgrades and free hotel stays from Turkish nationals. They say Adams also received campaign contributions from straw donors, some of which helped him qualify for more than $10 million in matching public campaign funds. Mayor Adams abused that privilege and broke the law. Laws that are des designed to ensure that officials like him serve the people, not the highest bidder, not a foreign bidder, and certainly not a foreign power. It's an unfortunate day, and it's a painful day. But inside of all of that, it's a day when we will finally reveal why for 10 months I have gone through this. And I look forward to defending myself yeah. and defending the people of this city as I've done throughout my entire professional career. All right, so what's next? If Adams leaves office before the end of his term, he'll actually be replaced by public advocate Jermaine Williams, who would be in charge of setting up a special election. Important to note, New York's governor does have the power to remove Adams from office, but hasn't said yet if she would take that step. Now to our big story of the night. A new AP NORC poll shows how many Americans believe Vice President Harris's gender will hurt her chances of getting elected. And that number is higher than those who saw it as a hurdle for Hillary Clinton back in 2016. Let's go by the numbers with this poll. This poll surveyed a little more than 2,000 people. And out of those 2,000 people, 4 in 10 people, 4 in 10, say they believe Harris's gender will hurt her chances of getting elected to the Oval Office. Now let's compare that to Clinton for a moment. About 3 in 10 said the same thing about 2016 Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. And you'll remember that campaign ended in a loss to Donald Trump. Now speaking of the former president, compare the numbers for Harris and Clinton to him. Just 1 in 10, 1 in 10, believe that his gender will hurt his chances of being uh, elected. And those numbers are similar to 2016. But being a man, no one can argue whether you're blue or red that that's probably not a huge factor. As I always say, we want to hear from you. And that means some days I talk to people by using my cell phone to shoot interviews, getting a pulse on all things people, power, and politics. This morning, by the way, I had the chance to host a town hall for the Detroit Economic Club at their 10th annual leader conference. A great place to meet some Gen Z voters who have some thoughts about women running for the highest office. Here's what they told me. All right, let's talk about this. Uh, Hillary Clinton in 2016, Kamala Harris now, women in office, running for office. Your thoughts, does this feel different than the last time? I would say it does feel different than last time. Um, I know about it more, it's in the media more, and it is being presented to our young our young children, our young girls, that this is something that is achievable. It happened then in 2016, and now it's happening again, and it's just going to keep happening if we keep pushing it. Gabrielle is on the pulse. Gabrielle, a lot of people are saying that the last time uh, a woman ran for office was 
2016. Does this feel different to you to have another one? It right? definitely feels different. Um, as a black woman, a woman of color, seeing Kamala Harris, representation is important. I mean, I have my blue on today, and I was listening to Beyonce because of Kamala. Um, she's an inspiration for us all, and I can't wait until November to go for her. Ashley's on the pulse tonight. Ashley, um, Kamala Harris, uh, female leadership in the White House. How important is that for you? It is so important to me. As a black woman, I believe it's important to see representation in the White House. And I'm so excited and hopeful for Kamala to lead in the sense. Do you think that this is a lot different than Hillary Clinton when she ran, or do you think there's some similar vibes? I think the momentum is a lot different. Um, it brings a new sense of energy. I see Gen Z a lot more involved and a lot more memes, social media rising, and just excitement. Look, if you see me around town, I have my cell phone, you have a thought, come up to me and let's talk. You could be on the pulse as well. We also asked you the question on fox2detroit.com, does a candidate's gender impact your support for them? If you'd like to weigh in, just scan that QR code on the bottom right of your screen. Remember, this is not a scientific poll. This is just a little sampling. So far, most of you who voted say no, it does not. So now the question is what to make of this poll. A Democratic and Republican woman are in the hot seat to talk about this. If the country's going backwards or forwards, what's going on here? You're watching The Pulse on Fox 2. Back now on The Pulse, covering all things people, power, and politics in Michigan and across the country. In the hot seat tonight to talk about the polls showing Harris's gender could be an obstacle to her getting elected. Former Democratic State Rep Sherry DeGay-Dagnago and conservative commentator and finance co-chairman of the Michigan Republican Party, Lena Epstein. Good to see you both. Thanks for joining us here. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having us. All right, let's talk about this. Uh, that latest poll, um, it, regardless of whether or not you're a Democrat or a Republican, many women on both sides, Republicans and Democrats, would say, what is going on here? Four in ten. By the way, Democratic men that were polled in this particular poll said that Kamala Harris's gender could be an obstacle. Sherry, does that surprise you as compared to three in ten Hillary Clinton? No, and, and this is not um, partisan specific. I mean, I served with women who I still communicate with on the other side of the aisle. They had their issues with men in their caucus and how they were treated in leadership and leadership opportunities not provided. So these biases transcend party lines. So Democrat or Republican, uh, I know that many of them have views about women that are not always uh, the most progressive. Uh, but women are making our, we're making our mark uh, on both sides of the aisle, and I applaud them. And I want to get to Lena in a minute, but as, as an African-American woman and someone who cares deeply about how perception is, four in ten say Kamala Harris, that could be an issue, the gender. Three in ten said that for Hillary Clinton. What gives? exactly sure why those numbers exist and it depends on who you're talking to if you're talking in the african-american community um oftentimes the, the uh, matriarch of the family is revered especially in many countries across the waters uh that women are oftentimes making a lot of leadership uh decisions in guiding and guiding and nurturing the family and so big mama is revered in our family so i'm not sure where why that exists from. or where it is and what the actual demographic breakdown of that is is, uh, but it is disappointing to hear. It's curious, interesting, and not at all uh, good, and no one's celebrating this, uh, perhaps except for the people who are taking the poll. But Lena, what, what do you make of these numbers? I think I take polling data um, like a dime a dozen. Mm. Um, you've got to really take it with a grain of salt what the numbers say. I think that when it comes to the election, I think that people are going to vote not on gender, but which candidate is best prepared to serve and best prepared to lead the nation at this time. Americans are, are really activated with 39 days until the election. They're paying attention to the policies. I think that Donald Trump's policies create the greatest economic opportunity for men and women, and that's why I'm supporting him wholeheartedly. And we're going to get into the politics uh, for, with both of you in a minute, but I just want to go through a list of some of the countries, dozens of countries that have had female leaders before. Angela Merkel in Germany, Indira Gandhi in India, Pakistan, Norway, Margaret Thatcher in the UK, Israel, uh, Ireland, Liberia, Bangladesh, Helen Clark, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, 
Yet in America, it's such a novel concept to have a woman running for office. Is, is that a problem for us in our country? I don't think it's novel that women are running for office. I think women run for office every day in this country. We want to encourage men and women who are qualified to govern to step up but and But is serve. the rest of the world more progressive than America in electing this, the number of leaders that have taken to the helm in other countries compared to America? It's, it's daunting. I don't think it's progressive versus non-progressive. I think it's candidate specific and each of these nations were ready for a female president. Well, Sherry? I disagree in that regard. I think there are many biases that exist in America, unfortunately, and it shows up uh, in the voting booth. And so we have to change the trajectory of this country and how it views women. I was listening at one poll that talked about uh, the, 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 the views on uh, Kamala Harris's uh, perspective on the economy versus Donald Trump. I mean, the numbers were lagging with respect to how her, pro her policies are viewed. And I think in many instances, if, I'm, as a former science teacher, once, you know, math teacher, uh, it's how women are viewed even in the field, uh, the STEMs, and in science and math. And so it shows up, in, the biases shows up in many ways, and we have to address it. But we're seeing that progress as we move forward. And I disagree that, that Kamala Harris's uh, policies are, in fact, the best for women in this country, women on either side of the aisle, especially when it comes to making decisions about our bodies, making decisions about our families, making sure we move forward progressively. So you're the finance co-chairman of the Michigan Republican Party. Party. And I got to ask you, as a Republican and a proud Republican, do you think your party could do better in empowering women to feel like perhaps gender isn't and shouldn't be an issue? I am a, an example that women can be empowered in the party. I came from nowhere in the party. I was born to a family of Democrats. I found my way into the Republican Party, followed the breadcrumbs. As a young woman, I was supported by fine conservative men over the last 15 years that made me into the person that I am today. Ultimately, I think the American people are going to elect Donald Trump, not because he's a boy and she's a girl, but because he has the qualifications and the credentials to lead the country at this very critical moment. But do you think the party, your party, has a responsibility to perhaps help bust all the stigmas with women and help promote and elevate women within I, the party? We, we do promote women. We do elevate women. We, we have a very beautiful uh, policy portfolio that gives women the most opportunities, that gives women's husbands and kids the opportunities as well. Um, really, at the end of the day, I think it comes down to who has the better economic policy. I'm still waiting for Kamala Harris's economic policy. Where has she been the last four years as well, the Vice President of the United do you, States? Do you think Sherry, I think, I think you watched the interview with MSNBC? Yes, I did. What did you think about Kamala Harris's I, performance I, I, as someone who was interviewed? I think, I think she's she's made a massive um, advancements in developing her own policies and not just lingering in the background based on being vice president and, and really having to carry uh, President Biden's policies. And I think she's emerged to share what her platforms are. Can we do more to express what those are and how they will fully uh, improve our overall economy? I think she She's doing that. We're building, and we got 39 days to build it, just a little bit faster. But I want to, I want to touch a point here: the, the Republicans have held control of the House and Senate for a number of years in this uh, in the state of Michigan, and I have yet to really see women empowered on the other side of the aisle being a speaker in either chamber. Uh, and so I've talked to many Republican women who have led and served as chairs or vice chairs of committees, but they had to fight like hell to get a leadership role in their specific caucus. And we know that's a reality. I applaud what you've been able to do, Thank you. but it's really not a reality when you look at the legislature. And I have plenty of friends. Lena, is your story sides. a unique story then? I, I have so many female friends in the Michigan Republican Party in positions of leadership and authority. And I think that we're only gonna see more of that. I have a daughter who turns seven next month. I'm gonna raise her in our party. She's already been embraced. The Republican Party embraces the youth. When President Trump was president, we had record low unemployment for Hispanics, African Americans, women. These are the records that we're hanging on to, and these are the policies that are going to promote our win in November. Sherry Gay, yesterday we had Mary Waters, the councilwoman, on with us here on The Pulse, and she invited on our behalf the vice president to come on The Pulse and talk to that would be journalists. Amazing. Here's the issue that, that so many journalists have, and you take, look, I, I'm going to get picked on for this, but I'm just going to be honest with you. You can't fact check hope. 
You can't fact check someone who's talking about their story about how they came up, but you can fact check policy. And so many journalists are still waiting on some more harder hitting interviews. How much would that benefit her to do those in the coming weeks? Oh, huge. I mean, economy, the econ by far, the economy is the number one issue, the top ranking issue for all Americans in this country. And so I agree. Mm -hmm. um, our vice president has to have strong, a strong foundation in economic policy that will really show how we're going to move the economy. But I have to say that President Trump benefited from what the Democrats had already built. And so it's not his leadership that provided the, a, we have a, a 50, thriving 15 economy. 15 seconds left. I am rebuttal. yet to hear Kamala Harris present an economic policy and a vision for the nation. We are going to elect Donald Trump in November, and we're going to have a fabulous four years. Can't wait to see you on election night. I'll tell you one thing. Kamala Harris for president is about empowering women, protecting women. And I have to say, Donald Trump has been nothing but someone who has attacked growth. Two passionate, right two women. Donald Trump passionate loves women. women. He loves two women. Two passionate women. Who far are too much, I guess. Two passionate women <laughs> on the set of The Pulse here tonight. We're going to continue to talk See you to night. both of them, of course, about <laughs> what's coming. The ultimate poll, the most important one, is the one that you go to on Election Day. President Biden addressing an issue that's all too common in our country. Gun violence. How he hopes it'll make schools safer while making those drills less traumatic for children. You're watching The Pulse on Fox 2. Thank you, ladies, both, for joining us here today. Back now on The Pulse, looking at all things people, power, and politics from the D to D.C. President Biden taking aim when it comes to guns in America. Today, he signed off on an executive order to help create new school shooter drills and make them less traumatic for kids. The president is ordering staff to develop and publish a plan within 110 days regarding existing research on drills and how to really create and implement age-appropriate ones for K-12 through students. During his speech this evening, he also talked about working with schools to discuss safe storage with parents, saying they play a big responsibility in keeping people safe and called for more accountability on a national scale. Star holding parents accountable for being negligent. By the way, if you pull up here wherever you parked and left your key in your car and a student steals the car and gets in an accident, you are held responsible. Why in the hell would not that be the case if you lived a gun case open? Meantime, the other focus of his executive order, conversion devices, which help turn handguns into fully automatic weapons, as well as 3D printed firearms, along with concerns with those 3D guns. They're built without metal, making them undetectable by machines used at places like airports and courthouses, unlike these guns. They also lack serial numbers, making it hard for police to match them to crime scenes. The president's order will also establish an emerging firearms threats task force, which will have to issue a report within 90 days that includes an assessment of the threat posed by those machine gun conversion devices and 3D guns. Today's executive order comes less than a week after a mass shooting in Birmingham, Alabama left four people dead and 17 others hurt. Well, taking a look at some of the numbers, according to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been 404 mass shootings in the U.S. This year alone, resulting in more than 400 people losing their lives and leaving more than 1,700 others hurt. Of those shootings, 11 have happened right here in Michigan this year, leaving one person dead and 71 hurt. Three of those shootings happened in just one day. Now, keep in mind, a mass shooting is defined as four or more people either being hurt or killed, not including the gunmen themselves. Now, the Gun Violence Archive does not list specific numbers for school shootings, but according to the Sandy Hook Promise, since the attack at Columbine High School in 1999, more than 338 thousand students in the U.S. have experienced gun violence at school. These numbers should be alarming to anybody. And a reminder about the statewide OK to Say program here in Michigan. It lets students anonymously share tips about school threats or violence concerns via text, calls, emails, or through the OK to Say website. Now, since it was started back in 2014, the program has received more than 56,000 tips. And by the way, you can just screenshot this on yourself and take a look at this. And if you want more information, go to their website or text as well. That is the pulse for tonight. Remember, you can always reach out to me via email. My email is roop.raj at fox.com. I may just read your mail on the air, even if it's not very nice. We read them all. Your thoughts could end up on TV. Battleground with SE Cup is next. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah.